Well, hi, my name is Dave Hansen. I'm the executive director of Authors Alliance. Authors Alliance is a nonprofit whose mission is to advance the interests of authors who want to serve the public good by sharing their creations broadly. Uh, and so we do that through creating resources, um, as well as um, promoting and advocating for public policy that promotes um, knowledge and culture and availability. Uh, and a big part of what we do is promoting the role and the mission of libraries and archives and galleries and museums. Uh, and personally, my background actually comes from that same direction. So uh, prior to taking on the role at um, Authors Alliance, I was a librarian at Duke University responsible um, broadly for their collections, as well as their support of authors on copyright and intellectual property issues, as well as a broad array of research. I, I have seen firsthand, both from the author side and from the researcher side, uh, and in fact, many times they're the same, one and the same person, um, the benefits of open uh, GLAM. Open access in particular is one of the features of open GLAM that I have seen just have a tremendous impact in terms of the availability and, and public understanding of our culture and history. Um, there's vast stores of um, materials that are, are basically locked away inside some very large, very well-off institutions. And what's really amazing to me is that you have places like the Library of Congress or Harvard University or places like where I worked at Duke University that um, have a real mission to take these treasures really that they have um, and expose them to the world uh, so that more people can gain access, more people can learn, more people can experience um, what has in previous times been limited to just a very small group of people who happen to be wealthy enough and fortunate enough to be able to gain access. In terms of barriers and challenges that the open glam community faces, uh, there, there are a number. One is that the whole community is made up of organizations that are really nonprofit. Um, and, and by that, I mean really nonprofit. Like they don't have huge uh, sums of money to go spend on advocating for laws and policies that better reflect the needs and interests of the public. Um, and I've experienced this showing up at meetings with regulatory bodies and um, even you know with legislators where there's a handful of people representing the views of open glam and the public. And there's like an army of lawyers representing corporate intellectual property interests that have um, a significant interest in uh, expanding copyright, making enforcement more aggressive, and for, for their own profit interests. And I don't fault them for that, but those things often um, bound up against uh, the interests of the public and uh, the interests of readers and users, as well as authors who care about the public gaining access to their works. So, you know, one of the things that really opened my eyes and uh, mind about GLAM um, was uh, a meeting several years ago through a group um, that's still operating today called writestatements.org. This was uh, organized under the auspices of Europeana in the EU um, and uh, the Digital Public Library of America in the US. And it was an effort to pull together um, organizations that had an interest in clarifying and communicating better about the right status of materials in the collection so that users could know how to use them. And one of the things that really um, hit home to me in that discussion is just how broad um, the community is. So, you know, oftentimes you get into these meetings and you're, you're together with um, the, the biggest national libraries and the biggest um, university libraries, and they have uh, a real interest in and a capacity to engage on um, policy issues related to openness. 
But one of the things that really opened my eyes in that discussion was um, talking with some of the folks from the Digital Public Library of America who were trying to take these kind of abstract copyright and policy issues and translate them down into um, you know, a local historical society uh, or a local gallery that maybe has two employees um, or you know, an organization that's going around and scanning materials out of the back of a van uh, in a local community so that they can preserve these things and make them available to the world. And that really opened my mind to just how broad and incredibly diverse this, uh, this community is and why it's so important that uh, we pursue openness, not just for those elite institutions or the institutions that can afford to have like a lot of lawyers figure out the rights issues, but for everybody so that we can really um, provide equitable access to, to these materials in their collections. So I guess, you know, one message I have for those organizations that might have some hesitation about opening up their collections, uh, I guess I have two messages. One is having worked with a large number of institutions that are focused on these kinds of issues. Um, there's always a concern about risk, right? What if I open things that um, I'm not sure if I have rights to, or what about orphan works? That's a big issue of works that I know are protected, but I, I can't quite figure out how to um, nail down permission. Uh, the risks have proven to be incredibly low. Um, they're not zero, and you should take your time and be careful with what you're doing so that you can open up things uh, responsibly. But if you look across the world, really, um, the risks that those institutions have faced uh, by um, opening up their collections, I think, have been far, far outweighed by the benefits that they've seen by providing um, open access to their collections. And I always view that as, you know, you're, you're trading one risk for another. Um, there's a risk by not opening up collections of um, really undermining your core mission as an organization and undermining your value uh, and, and just your existence. Um, and so on the one hand, it can feel very scary to know that there are these legal mechanisms out there that might pose a challenge at some point in some way, uh, even though those haven't really been realized for most institutions. But I think that other risk um, is very clear and present for many institutions that if we're not opening up our collections and providing broader access to the world um, in a world that's increasingly digital, uh, we we will scare ourselves into irrelevancy. Uh, and that is, I think, a kind of existential risk for, for the whole community and would be really, really sad for the future for researchers, for authors, for just the public who wants to engage with those collections, but they can't because the organizations that used to host them have disappeared. Uh, and so I think that's that's the big message that I have is that those risks um, are worth taking. <laughs>